this one. Check my microphone. Okay, that sounds good, if not a bit quiet. Okay, check your microphone. La la la. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah, okay. All those things sound good. But we're in the wrong room. No such thing as a perfect start. <laughs> Alrighty, let me just make sure I don't hear myself, because I hate double talk. Hello, and welcome to another Some Sort of Talk Show. Uh, we are continuing our trek through the Monster Manual. I am your tour guide, and joining with the, me today is, as always, uh, Even. Hello. So last time we did the this placer beast. Placer beast, right? I was like, was that was that devils? Like, <laughs> my memory <laughs> is super bad. Um, we spent a long time with devils and demons. Like, this is true. Two um, months, like. Long. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was pretty much two months because it was like one one section a week, and it was three sections each, so six sections in mm -hmm. total. Yay! Yeah, Matt. and then we <laughs> yeah. Oh. So but now today, we're on the <laughs> yes. So now today we are traveling through. I think we're midway through the D's, right? Like. There's not that many more. <laughs> yeah, <we know. laughs> Thank you. That has been some sort of talk show for today. <laughs> um, so today we are doing the doppelganger. The doppelganger. Um <laughs> I would love, like, if you're like, oh, it's a doppelganger, and they're like, it's pronounced doppelganger, and like, mm, you know, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, th I think you're wrong. Just everyone else is like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um. So how was how was this one for you? Eh, it was okay. I think the last couple of weeks, um, like through uh, the demons and devils, I kind of was like. I want to say I was like stepping up my game a little bit and I was really getting into it and like the backgrounds and like interesting poses. And then I personally, I don't think the like the art um, uh, or the final product of my Displacer Beast was up to par to any of those. Uh, if you take away the fact that like uh, it was animated. <laughs> So the animation itself was its own layer of complexity. So like this one was kind of like a dip down. So it was kind of like, it was interesting trying to still make it interesting, but like knowing that it was like, ah, I don't know. But it was, it was a fun read. And I think I will talk more about doppelgangers uh, in just a general sense than like how it relates to my drawing. But you know, I did it. It was fun. On my end, it was more a struggle as to, well, so the, the first struggle is just choosing which method of presentation I wanted, because there were two, and I'll say the first one because you'll obviously see the second one, um, but the first one is just getting, is just making a space, so you just take a cube or a sphere, you know, something with volume, and then you add what's call a, called a, called a boolean modifier to that and you just have it um, take the difference so what that essentially does is anything inside that volume whatever's assigned to that volume will just disappear so you can do something interesting with that like you can so you can have your initial um, model and then as you raise that you know raise it up um, one model will obviously you would need two of these volumes so one will have the one will have the reveal and the other one will be slowly taken away as you you know swap the model from one mm -hmm. to the other 
Um, but I didn't go with that because... Why did I do that? <laughs> um, I didn't go with that because it what it it didn't it would have been too it would have been too sharp of a change you know like I probably would have needed like a particle system or some sort of like flash of light or something to kind of like indicate that there's like a change going on because otherwise you're just doing a kid picks like erase change like if anyone remembers yeah. what that is. Um. <laughs> But yeah, and then the the second, probably the most, the thing that kind of kept me from actually working on the project the most was just trying to figure out what model I can start with and then what model I finish with that doesn't get me into a legal battle. Because <laughs> um, I, I originally wanted to use um, Master Chief from Halo, but there's a couple problems with that. So the way the doppelganger works, so at a function level, the way the doppelganger works is it will um, it will take on the properties of the fleshy bits of another of another humanoid. Um, and so the reason why Master Chief doesn't really work is because what you what you see, through the, through the majority of that video game, is not him. It's his armor, which a doppelganger cannot do. So unless the doppelganger went away and, like, killed Master Chief in Halo 1 and then tried to assimilate himself into Halo 3 or something, then mm, maybe that might work. But, you know, there's nothing visual there for me to kind of depict, hey, there's this really gross kind of alien-looking creature and it shifts into Master Chief because he's just a hundred percent armor. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and then which just... I think is an interesting, an interesting thing uh, to talk about. Which I have two points on there: one more serious and one really stupid. Um, <laughs> but like of the serious one, like you could go that whole uh, mystique route where like she just runs around naked. And technically, if you think about it, she's just making her skin look as if it is, like, clothes or anything. But it's just skin. That's all. Or skin and bones-ish, depending on how you want to interpret, like, in doppelgangers and uh, those. Which is, like, creepy. But, like, if you really think, like, if we're okay with it turning into, like, say, a lizard person or a turtle or something. Like, where it's just, like, they have a shell or scaly hide that is, like kind of separate bits but not like yeah that could look like i could make i don't know clothes if i was really good at it but it is kind of weird but then brings me to the stupid bit that like one of the things that i was thinking of doing which i didn't do because i was super tired yesterday i have like very mild insomnia like things that every once in a while i lose a night of sleep and so yet the night before i lost a night of sleep so i was just not able to function well but I was thinking, like, if a doppelganger, for the most part, can only change their, their body, uh, but not their clothes, and they need to change into somebody else's clothes, doppelgangers would be amazing. They'd be those, like, world-class people that, like, like strip out of their clothes in just, like, <laughs> seconds and then put on clothes. And so I kind of wanted to animate, like, one, like, wiggling out of their clothes super quick and then wiggling into someone else's clothes, like, after they changed. But that's, like, that'd be a lot of animating, even if I did it as, like, um, keyframe, like, drawings, mm. that, like, maybe if I had yesterday to work, which uh, uh, I just couldn't have, I couldn't have. It was barely functioning yesterday. That'd be interesting if one of us just presented a, an animated version of a, like, a magician's quick change act, but, <laughs> um, you know, the whole time we're just sitting there going, how is this a doppelganger? Like, it's not, I don't know. <laughs> For 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 every for every normal human in the audience, it's really cool that they're able to switch from a dress into a tuxedo like that. But the real trick is the one that's never revealed to you guys: is the fact that that is not that's not a woman, and it's not even human. So, <laughs> or it would, I mean, it'd be a funny magician's thing as like as they're pulling it out, and they, you'd probably do a couple of things of like just getting their sh shirt over their head and struggling, and then they pull it out, but their head is then different. <laughs> they, like, go, like, uh, then they, like they put on the thing and they put their hand through and their hand is different and it's got like nail polish and, like as they're like 
rolling the stockings up over the leg, like the hair is going away, like just before the like it becomes like smooth skin before the stockings go on. Yeah. Or vice yeah. versa. I don't know. Maybe smooth legs, and you pull the stockings off, and there's like hair sprouting out. Like it could be a fun, a fun. I I'd watch that like a uh, doppelganger <laughs> magic show like thing. There's a lot of things that a doppelganger can do as far as, like, a mundane magic show could go. Like, in a world where people can shoot fireballs from their hands, like, a magic show is probably, like... But, you know, in our world, in our reality, you know, to see to see a dude, like, pull off, you know, to pull, you know, pull off their shirt, but then their head is purple, you're just like, wait, what? And then they put on a hat or something, and it's, like, a diff, like, it's, like, it's no longer like a young man, but it's now like an old like lumberjack or something. You're just like, is that a part of the act or what's going on on stage up there? <laughs> that he yeah, that reminds little, me like... of that one movie, The Prestige. <laughs> like that, um, kind of talked about that issue of like there. Was, I mean, it was two dueling magicians, like real, like uh, for the most part, real life, like people doing magic tricks and not like. Uh, fantasy magic but like one was critiquing the other i'm just like yeah he does this and he does it so good it's such a great trick but he's so boring to watch <laughs> whereas like he takes and does pretty much that trick in a different way but is so much more interesting to watch um that i i bet it's the same for magic of just like your average magic user is like like they're very more mechanical of it, and like I did it, I made a dove, but it was like no, nothing interesting about how we did it. Whereas like you do need that one performer magician of just like, and then look, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, it's not about the execution; it's about the presentation. Ah, I bit my tongue. Um, as a, as a quick tangent on that, um, Avatar: The Last End Airbender had one episode that kind of featured that same idea, where Aang was looking around for a firebender, and they happened to see a stage performance, and he was wowed by the performer. But the performer was actually doing really mundane firebending; it just made it look fantastic. Um. Mm. All right. So with that, let us see how we did our doppelgangers. So I believe, let's see, who's first? Uh, show number one. Oh, you. Am I? I thought it was you, but I, I forget. It's good. So it's me. So if you've watched me before, uh, you guys know that uh, I love playing in the world of Eberron. Uh, so I kind of took this as like in between a doppelganger and like a uh, changeling and I took away kind of like the evil side of it but also like I kind of changed things around um, because I, after I was like reading and they were saying like they really can't change their like they can't manifest clothes unless you are really warping the idea of what they can make their flesh into so uh, it was kind of a, a more from a practical, like, oh, what do I wear today? Do I wear this thing or do I wear this thing? And then, like, if I wear this, then, like, what if I change my face like this? And so it was more of a fun sort of thing of, like, uh, you know, what am I going to wear and who am I going to personify today? So it was kind of fun, like, playing around with this mirror and, like, designing the character twice. And then three or four times, really, because, like, it's like also the two perspectives, but also like how are we perceiving the bits? So it was it was kind of I don't know it was interesting and I feel I don't know I feel okay about it going a little bit more more cartoony with the uh, the proportions, but it makes it a little bit more dramatic. Did my video freeze? I don't see any. I don't. Uh, oh no, there it is. Okay. <laughs> I was uh, like, I was like, I, don't, I was like, I don't see any Putting buttons on. Uh, maybe that's what it yeah. was. I was like, it's hard. I wish I could. Sorry, I was like, usually for these beginning parts, um, your ad, your additions are a lot more 
obvious and then it become it be, it gets uh, more and more subtle as it gets closer to like to the finish but that one there was just like a it looked like there was just a long pause of just like contemplation of like how do i want to keep doing this <laughs> yeah no it switched into making some buttons but it was because <laughs> there was in this one a lot of little things that i didn't want to get lost in the the making and i should have you'll see me eventually when i like color in that uh the clothes i kind of spend a little bit more time coloring around the buttons and the stuff whereas like i really probably should have painted it as one big old black thing put the highlights and shadows and then put buttons on it but it was hard to imagine it in its volume without those signifiers of buttons and like uh the opening and stuff like that can you talk about that mirror real quick? So I saw that suddenly everything wiped away and then you did the mirror, but it was in porch or it was in whatever the front face thing. And then you swung it around as if it was a 3D asset. Like what? <laughs> yeah. So I turned off the visibility of the layer I'm currently sketching on. And then I turned on, I created a new layer and turned on the symmetry tools. And I just drew out a, uh, a rectangle and then pretty much drew one side of the, uh, the mirror filigree frame and it like created the second one. And then what I did is I turned on both my visibility on both layers again and I lassoed the, uh, the flat plane uh, mirror and I turned it on to distort, which allowed me to like change, like, to warp it a little bit and so i just warped it until it fit the skewed angle of the original mirror oh yeah, yeah i don't know it, it, it gave it that you know a little extra flourish uh to fill in that because i guess i could have left it boring but uh <laughs> since this one has like this lovely lovely red dress tights and like high heels um, but then also is deciding whether they want to wear this, like, beautiful, skinny, double-breasted, um, like, suit. Like, I figured that they'd probably have some a decent mirror. Not decent. Uh, excessive mirror, you guys. Sorry, I'm not trying to make people look bad. But, <laughs> See, to but me, it was fun. Right I was kind of going through. Oh, Sorry, there you go. Uh, um... I was also looking at references of, um, I think it's uh, Vitligo, um, but the like two-toned uh, skin condition that some people have as like a reference of like shifting in between this like the colorless um, doppelganger, like white flesh and hair and stuff. And between like, it was quite more of a, I don't know, um, I don't know, the, the more filled out colored skin of like both the kind of elven mustachioed man but, or the human lady. Yeah, earlier I was, I was gonna say that before you, uh, um, I wanted to race before you started coloring in the, the double-breasted suit, but um, right now it kind of looks like they're trying to determine whether or not they want to go to, like, they want to infiltrate, like, this ball or this gala as, like, as, like, a as like the duchess in her, you know, in her nice red suit, in her uh, red dress, or as the bellhop. <laughs> so it's like, huh, do I, do I go for, for high class and infiltrate that way, or do I go in as a more subtle, like, I'm a part of the staff? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's fun. Uh, the, um, in Eberron, uh, changelings, um, which is, I don't know, we'll jump back to, like, uh, mythology and stuff. But, like, changelings is, like, a player race. That's pretty much what they've described. It's, like, a kind of the creator of Eberron was, like, they wanted to take some traditionally, like, monstrous races, like werewolves and dopper, doppelgangers, as well as orcs, and then make them more of a civilized like race that people that when you see one you're not like <gasps> evil but you're like oh you're different um and so like uh playing around with this changeling thing was kind of fun but like uh there is like a changeling at least one changeling like town or something 
where it, it's a lot of changelings. And there, uh, something that I thought was like really funny is that they view the like sometimes the personas as like the uniform, so that like multiple people might or multiple changelings might have the job of being like a shopkeeper. But when they go in for their shift at work, they change into the shopkeeper. And it looks like, you know, whatever, like dwarven uh, bearded man. Uh, but when their shift is over, they leave and they turn into, you know, their like outside out, uh, persona, which could be like fancy lady. And then as the other person that comes in is like, whatever. And so I thought this was kind of like a, a funny sort of just like, I don't know. This is like, this is my, I don't know, different personas. Yeah, it's not it's not applying for the job to be a barista. It's applying to the job to be Boren the barista. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then like Boren is just like that's Boren is the job. <laughs> like that's how it goes. Like, you don't just make the coffee, you look like Boren. Everybody expects Boren when you go to get the coffee. Yeah, that'd be cool. It's kinda like dinner and a show, so it's like you're not you're not there. You're not expected just to make the coffee, but you're also there to be the personality as well. Because it's mm -hmm. like it could be it could and be think... extremely mediocre coffee, but Boren's a friggin' he's friggin' amazing. He does he knows all the stories. <laughs> right. And I think we all can like understand that on some level that we have our different personas with friends or families or uh or at work that we put on these uh costumes like of like our personality <laughs> and i think that was kind of fun let's see do, do doppelgangers exist in eberron or did they just get switched out for changelings they do the way that they kind of look at doppelgangers is that and there's a lot of openness there's like some things that are canon but even like the creators are like it's whatever you want really do what you want with them but like doppelgangers are that idea of like that maybe the feral precursor to what changelings were um and or a doppelganger is a unnatural creation that mimics what changelings do mm -hmm. so like a changeling on average can change their form, but like a hu an experiment that somebody did on a human might produce a doppelganger that is like now this evil warped infiltrator thing. Whereas your average doppelganger is like, oh yeah, I put on the Boris. I go to work, I be the Boris, and then I leave, and then I'm the Cynthia. Like, yeah. All right. But that was, that was mine. Having just a little bit of fun and appreciating clothes that I wish I had and bodies that I wish I could change into. Let's see. Whom shall I wear today? <laughs> Honestly, jealous. I wish I could change more. But it's... I don't know. The other thing... The other I don't thing know really people... Cool. Like, it's... Okay. The other thing hard. that's really cool hard about... <laughs> the other thing that's really cool about doppelgangers is... Um or that's an interesting asset to their like kit as far as like playing them and role playing them is the fact that they have they can they can sense like just the surface thoughts of maybe like one or two creatures so it, it really helps mm. them you know so it kind of further helps them with their disguise cuz they can and that's the kind of question that I wanted to pose after mentioning that is um when someone's looking for expectation, where does that lie? Like, is that a surface thought or is that like a subliminal thought? You know, so like if this person was going up and trying to present themselves as like a coworker or something, like would that expectation be floating on the surface or would it be sort of like this underneath thing that would be harder to kind of glean off of just being next to this guy? Honestly, I don't know. Like, I guess we could have some good answers and a little bit of research if we looked into, like, brain scanning. Um, but, I don't know. We don't have, like, we don't have a good science of being able to say what it is that you notice of that. Like, like if you are reading surface thoughts, 
like i don't know we're, we're diving into like science and like uh <laughs> and fantasy like what are you actually feeling do you hear the words or do you feel mo emotions or things or just like would it be just like oh someone's excited someone's excited turn and see who's excited at me like <laughs> Like, oh, somebody's frustrated. It means that you must know me, so I have to turn and raise an eyebrow. Like, yeah, because I mean, like right. when I was when I was reading that tidbit, it made me think that it was like, oh man, that would make that would make a doppelganger's ability to shape shift so much more, like, so much more perfect. Because if they could, if they could get a sense of what is expected of them when they're talking to, you know, the, this person I'm representing, then they can kind of cater their sentences toward, you know, toward that, that preconception. Yeah. But if and I'm sure that's how they would want it to go. But I kind of imagine it also in the, like, I think it'd just be confusing. Like if you, like how they depict sometimes like premonitions of stuff uh, of like, you see, like, I see myself in a cellar with like, there's crying and red, like, I don't know. And that'd be so confusing of just like, uh, I feel sad and wet all of a sudden right now. I don't know if that means tomorrow, three years from now. If I like, did I put on deodorant? Is this talking about right now, right now? Like, or if you have looked at brain scanning and it's just like, you see that red smudge right there that's happening. Yeah. That's saying that like, they're thinking about, maybe food at the moment or gas i'm not sure <laughs> like so if that's how doppelganger's reading surface thoughts is like mm, i sense uh orange cloud i must mean do i frown at you mm. well he's made a face hopefully that works like <laughs> yeah because that's because that's the other that's the other half of that coin is that if expectation is more in the realm of the subconscious you know it's just kind of those background thoughts then that would make a doppelganger's ability a little harder to use and they would have to focus more into the perception skill tree of like you know lip reading the you know i can read your you know i can read your face and your emotions just so that i can kind of catch myself if like there's an expectation trap or something you know so it's like i'm trying mm -hmm. to be cynthia who this person worked next to for the past three months who Cynthia is now dead in a bin, but this person doesn't know that. And so, you know, I have to try to get, you know, this key off of her. And I'm starting to go into some territory where, you know, I, I'm starting to not sound like Cynthia anymore. <laughs> but yeah. And then the last thing that I wanted to ask about the about that feature is for you as a DM, how do you play the surface thought game because it's not just npcs that do this there are some spells and abilities that allow players to also kind of read surface thoughts or read minds period um how how do you how would you role play that like does the whole huh. story kind of slow down a little bit so you can like write out like notes and just pass it to the person or what is your um it, it depends on who's doing it and how much i do want to slow down the game of like surface thoughts i i think at a certain level when you're playing with like certain players you just kind of uh you start learning of like who's good at at do at being able to separate like the meta of like what i heard and what i'm playing but also players are often thinking about what they're going to do so they're not even listening to the other players so it's okay sometimes if they like if somebody hears something that they they're not supposed to hear because they can build the play off of their you know uh, they're kind of cool with it um so and when they're playing against each other i think is a little bit more tricky where that's where you do want to keep secrets um but i've done some things of just like okay uh tell me you know uh give me that like a uh percept or, or a persuasion or deception check and just tell me what the result is and then, like, I only ever reveal of just, like, is he telling the truth if the other person wins with the insight? But I don't know. I kind of, like, I haven't had too many players go for this, like, reading thoughts or things. Um, but 
but I have had monsters do it to them. And so I've had to ask them what their surface thoughts are. And I will, I just say, list off three things that come to mind right now when you think of this, or like, uh, or I'll describe the scenario. And then I'll like, what was the first couple thoughts that you had? So that they can have a visceral of like, if they were thinking about like, like, man, my character hasn't eaten in a while. Or like, what's that brown thing over there? <laughs> like, I mean, that's what the monster gets. It dug into the mine and all, the, all they got was like, hmm, tacos and brown thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, because like, um, there's a lot more like, uh, I, I wouldn't call them early tier, but there's a lot of like mid tier monsters that a DM can throw at their players really quickly. So like the doppelganger is kind of one of them, but that gets to, into the more like heavy role play sort of story arc, um, which mm -hmm. is why you may not see a lot of doppelgangers being used, just because a lot of people play D and D for the I want to put my sword in something, um, and then. There's other things like the Nothic that doesn't use surface thought reading as much as to infiltrate or to get, you know, to get something. They're using it to kind of track down where their, you know, where their units are and if they're paying attention to their surroundings, you know. So the minute that the players are just starting to think about, like, bet, you know, um, hunkering down, building a campfire and eating and stuff, then the Nothic might move in and try to drag someone away. Um, and then everything else gets a lot higher tier, like you get the mind flares and all that stuff, but then they have actual mm -hmm. spells that are like mind read, <laughs> which then becomes a little mini event in and of itself of now you're battling against this other creature to see how much information they get to, they get to glean from your entire mind. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think doppelgangers are weird things. Oh, I get, so I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but didn't, or I said I would talk about it. Like, mythologically-wise, it was interesting reading up on do doppelgangers, and I didn't do anything with it. There was, like, something that I thought was kind of cool, but, like, doppelgangers in the actual, like, something that's been, a, like, a solid name has only existed for, like, I want to say, like, 100 years or so, but, like, throughout history, the concept of doppelgangers has been, like, a solid or has like floated around but under different circumstances and like different different things and so what we see now like in D D, is a very specific kind of iteration of a doppelganger of something that physically changes to look like something else um and they put in that creepiness of being able to like pick up on emotions and thoughts and stuff and then like in D, &D the stats wise it also gives it like sneak attack things but I think that's more of a functionality because we know that people are going to kill stuff. And so they're like, let's give doppelgangers some like basic rogue functions because why wouldn't they? Like, um, but like your standard doppelganger probably could be whatever they want, but it just would lean towards rogue because that makes sense. But like a long time ago, uh, doppelgangers for a good long while used to be like, it was a harbinger. It was like a, uh, like, like the Banshee, it was something that you, ex if you experienced a doppelganger, if you saw someone that looked like you, like, look exactly like you, or look exactly like uh, someone else, um, that was actually an omen that something terrible was going to happen. And there's, like, a lot of, like, actual documented things of, like, uh, like, I saw the doppelganger of my wife, and then my wife miscarriage, or, like, uh, and then this person committed suicide, or then I, like, got injured, like, it was a lot of weird things like that, that like the doppelganger was sometimes was even sometimes seen as like a spirit projection um, of like a some almost in like a alternate uh, reality or an alternate energy reality kind of thing uh, that if you experience the doppelganger, it was really trying to tell you something or you were something was supposed was going to happen. Like and I think that has tons of interesting story possibilities. Uh, in the same way that a uh, banshee does, but like banshee is something that's going to attack you and scream at you, like is is just like a weird 
thing that has happened in D&D because everybody's response to like, you see a banshee, you know, like, and instead of thinking like, oh no, my mother's going to die. They're like, I attack it. Give me experience. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the same with the doppelganger of like, oh shit, I saw Carl, but he didn't recognize me. Something bad is going to happen. They go like, I saw Carl. He's probably going to try to stab me later. I stab him. And they're like, well, I guess he stabs you because you stabbed him. Well, I mean, there are, there are old, um, northern stories of a village experiencing a banshee and then you know getting the getting the mob together and trying to or the you know whoever deems themselves the strongest warriors and going out you know to the mountain to try to destroy the banshee before some random person in the village croaks over dead um but it's one of those Mm -hmm. kind of white whale stories the way i remember it it's one of those white whale stories in which by go you know by going to try to chase this omen of this omen of not evil necessarily but just this death omen one by one the hunting party just kind of gets knocked off you know in various ways someone falls down a ravine someone gets eaten by a bear another person kills another person on accident yada 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 and yeah. eventually the one dude who's like i you know i i tried to gather all these people and it's you know now all these people are dead because of me i'm gonna do this thing meets the banshee and the banshee's just like i'm just a normal person <laughs> Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a funny. It's a it's a play on like the concepts of fate and stuff. Yeah, it's but interesting to hear that. Also, that was interesting is that in the fifth edition D and D thing, they put like a last thing of like doppelgangers or like I don't know, terrible parents, uh, and so they'll have their babies with people uh, and then just like leave their baby with that person. Uh, or they'll, like, steal someone else's child and replace it with, like, their doppelganger baby. Uh, and that child will grow up thinking that they're a regular person until, like, they hit puberty and then they start realizing that they're actually a doppelganger. Um, which I think is funny because that's uh, connected to the old fairy stories of changelings, which is, like, a there's a couple couple different kinds. There's, like, there's fairies, but there's also trolls or, like, enchanted logs of wood um of like those have been switched out for the actual child and they grow up as some evil thing and then eventually that evil thing is going to do something or run away with um someone something else uh and so that also is where like the fifth edition or the the eberron changeling name also comes from is that folk tale of like the the baby that has been changed for the doppelganger baby or for the baby that looks like or that is not your own so it's like these multiple fairy tales and myths that are coming together to make what we know as now the modern doppelganger or changeling depending on the D you're playing but so very different from what they present in the game true yeah that's what i was going to say too is it's interesting that the doppelganger is depicted as um in the stories is is depicted as kind of this omen and the because what i know of changelings is that they're generally in the stories they're generally depicted as like this evil thing that needs to be like detective you know investigated to find out which one is the changeling and you know quell this thing otherwise the entire village is just going to get replaced um but then in D &D, they kind of flip-flopped it and they made the changeling a playable race which generally dictates that they're leaning toward a more good alignment and then the doppelganger is constantly this npc that you know is just out to try to put a knife in someone's back or you know get riches steal riches off of some person Mm -hmm. Uh, lots of different ways it's it and i was originally going to say that the doppelganger is yet again another one of those criminally underused monsters but i believe that unlike the other ones that i've given that that key that title to um the doppelganger is a little more deserved because a i believe that they're harder to play as a single unit against the hero party and the mind read thing is is really tricky for a like a large player (laughs) for a large player base of the dms out there to kind of deal with it's just it's finicky and complicated or it can be complicated and then Mm -hmm. 
ultimately, like, they're just, like, at their base value, they're just an assassin, you know? Like, or if you really wanted to get into there, like, they're an imposter baroness or something that's sending the party off on these, like, goody two-shoes type stuff, but, like, deep down they're actually doing more harm or something like that. But um, it's sad. I say it's, it's criminally underused because there is a lot of story potential for the for the game as like a whole through the doppelganger. Yeah, um, it's funny. I played um, now a, one campaign. As like I ran like fourteen sessions, and then a one shot um, with a different player, and then I'm like getting started in another campaign. We haven't officially started our first date. Uh, for it, but there three different of my players have played changelings, and it's it's interesting seeing how they're going with it because the first one he's like like or the first two were like um, I play an Eberron, uh, but they're like hereditary changelings. They were born changelings, but they also play like outed changelings that they are constantly uh, they very often change in their like white like blank canvas. Uh, humanoid kind of stage and like one of them he uses it very rarely and has used it you know strategically to do some stuff but like most of the time he stood as like just the changeling whereas another player he actually it wasn't like terrible comic relief he wasn't like slapstick with it but he would very often just use it as like a it was how he expressed things and so like if one person was like he would often take the guise of, of the other players in the in the group to like emote things like if you wanted to be very serious he'd turn into the other serious character in there and he'd and, like he'd say his like serious one-liner but as the other person or even like somebody would go out and, like like hi i'm steven and he's like he'd go forward he'd turn into steven like hi i'm steven <laughs> and just like just to like mess with the guy like it was a very i don't know he was very playful with it in a very uh, strange way I'm looking forward to my next person that she has taken it in the sense that she is she was not born a changeling that she was like sacrificed as a child and like her like somebody her patron or whatever was like yes I will take this baby and has turned her into a, like a changeling and she has like defined her life as different people and she's like going into our new campaign which I'm excited for like, nobody knows she's a changeling, and she's making up her mind on whether or not, like, because something catastrophic is, or catastrophic to the group is going to happen, and she's, like, struggling currently with this, like, do I continue on with this persona trying to solve the issues here, or is this, like, the start of a new life? Do I become someone new in this moment? So I think that long haul kind of thing is going to be interesting, but we'll see how long she can keep it up. But I know this player... She enjoys secrets and role playing, so I think that's going to be the fun thing. Of like, she's gonna, she might even hold on to it for a long time before she ever lets the others know that she can turn into other something else. <laughs> and then, like, there's going to be a lot of like, wait, you what? Uh, uh. Like, I think that's uh, those are like the really cool ones. But I also enjoy the surface ones of like, you know, I I know those people that are chameleons that just play around with how they present themselves. And I think that's a very fun aspect too. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot easier to play those kind of characters when the rest of the party doesn't try to chase you down for backstory <laughs> or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh man, she is so good. And we've set up backstory. Like most of them have known her in her current life. And so they think that that is the true backstory, which is partially true. But not completely. And so they they I think they're satiated. Alright. <laughs> Alright, so let's move on into uh what I attempted to do with the doppelganger thing. And it was more of an exercise of not creation, but again of function. So um I had this base model lying around and I'm usually really good about documenting like where I get pre-made things but this one didn't have any like notification to it um so i just tried to change it as much as i could 
Um, so the idea is to take a generally humanoid, but at the same time strange sort of character. So I wanted to find a model that looked very much like just the modeling dummies that a lot of artists will have laying around their house. Um, huh. And then kind of add some, like, ribbing to, like, the chest area and, like, the skull and stuff. Um, give it that nice sort of classic bluish-purple tint, which... In this video, you can't really see too well, but I tried my best to get into that like blue purple area. It kind of uh, looks like that, like a dark gem Pokemon. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? The uh, Sableye? <laughs> yeah. <I think> so. <laughs> He's quite mad. That, hey, like, I, mean, I know what you're at, going for. At base value, that Pokemon is very shaped shape get doppelgangery but yeah so mm -hmm. then i was trying to figure out all right so i you know i can either go um blank white or whatever but just the concept that it starts off as this stark one color and then it could cuddle fish into whatever i you know eye shape and color that it is so we bring up our old faithful link model um we're still not monetized, so. Um, but if you also want to play around with this link model, you can go to nintendoresource.com. And yeah, so the idea is that um, I have my my strange non-human character, and I will shift that into a human character as best I can. And I mentioned before that I had one strategy which was to just make one invisible and prepare the other one to be invisible and then just switch the switch the volumes that hide or reveal so that one is just swapped out for the other but i thought that that looked too basic so i wanted to do this other thing which uses the um shrink wrap modifier which you've seen me do multiple times before it just sort of adheres a larger thing to a smaller thing or vice versa <clears throat> but um one setting for the modifier is that instead of doing it to adhere um, simply to the surface you can actually choose for it to go inside of that thing so it basically just crumples up into an area within the volume that you that you um direct it to and that's kind of what I wanted so that um, where it gets complicated is to have the the original the original form also have a shrink wrap modifier so that when one shrink wrap modifier gets um, activated, the other one is deactivating. So it's kind of this weird sort of crumpling as one so as one mass kind of balloons outward the other one shrinking into that form that gets kind of difficult in this scenario because technically the link model is still like seven different pieces and when you apply a shrink wrap, um, a shrink wrap model or when you apply a shrink wrap modifier to a thing that's in separate pieces that shrink wrapped object doesn't know where to adhere to, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, is it hard of... for you to merge things? Not really. So like but the, the reason, link... yeah, no, not not really. No, because um, the the shoulder pauldron thing, the vest and the belt are all were all separate things. And I merged all those initially, but the reason why I ultimately left those alone was because I reminded myself that the doppelganger doesn't do clothes. Or at least as far as the description in the monster manual goes, they don't do clothes. Mm -hmm. um, the, where my problem came in was because of the way the Link model is. So because the armband is one is one thing and it's kind of skin tight, um, the developers 
didn't include that arm length there. And so I had two options and I already kind of, let me see, why didn't it work? Um, so what I initially do is I, I try to attach the doppelganger's mesh to the arm that exists with the arm gauntlet, but that segments it into a hand and then the shoulder and then the torso and then an entire full other arm. So because of that disassociation, everything kind of gets messed up a little bit. Um, I eventually stuck with the original torso and arm but something still went wrong and i think if i remember correctly it was because of where i had the hands so everything was normal with the with the arms and the torso and stuff but because the hands the the proximity to the hands to the torso um some of the mesh didn't know quite where to go and so you'll see that issue later on but i tried to ignore it <laughs> um I don't remember what happened here. There was some weirdness here. And this is the reason why I eventually s reverted back to the old torso and arm. is because somewhere along the line, I messed up the, the texture. And that's why you saw purple hands and purple arms and stuff. Um, was because you weren't seeing the surface texture. You were seeing the... I believe it was the normal map. Which is the data that tells the colors where they should be. Otherwise, with certain other things, you can move that texture around so that the fingernails, like, for example, if the fingernails were a different color than the skin, if you had a messed up normal map, you could have the fingernails on this side of the hand instead. You know, that's the kind of power that you have over that. Uh, um, yeah, so we're just so we're just trying to move things into correct position. Um, so that I can then get to the more complex thing, which is actually um, assigning and applying the shrink wrap modifiers to stuff and then seeing if it works. And I don't know, in my opinion, it, it kind of worked out, but you know, I'll leave that up to y'all. See how, see how that works out. So... Again, it would have been awkward to have the Master Chief one in there because, A, I don't know what... I don't know how free that that one is. Um, I don't really know how free this one is either, but... Um, <laughs> I'm taking a risk with it because, again, I'm, you know, I'm not really making any money off of this. I'm just kind of using it for, for funsies. Um, but I'm totally willing to delete the video if that's an issue um but yeah it would have been weird to use the master chief one just because it would be master chief suit and then it would just be master chief suit again <laughs> maybe i could <laughs> i could make his art like you know i could make his his arms or wherever is not like a metal plate like it's more cloth like kind of shrink down a little bit like he's deflating and then like mm -hmm. re and then like repuff up or something so it's like he's changing from one form a transition into another form but that change would have been so minimal that i was just like nah let's let's do something that has less clothing but not but not that you know 18 and over type rating <laughs> you know <'Cause> I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if everyone's familiar with but um um Shantae and the Pirates Curse or something something curse. Shantae there's a it's a very scantily clothed genie woman <laughs> who runs around in a PlayStation world. And I was thinking of using a model that I had from that, but it seemed a little too close to that rated R <laughs> type scenario that I didn't know if I could actually show it on twitch.tv and then later on YouTube. So I was like, let's go with something safe. Everyone likes everyone likes Link. Legend of Zelda is pretty safe. So let's go with that. 
Um, and <laughs> it's have... funny whatever. Sorry. Go. And have this doppelganger transform into its fanboy version of Link from Breath of the Wild. <laughs> One of the first things that I wanted to do um, was I wanted to have. I was thinking of doing a little bit of animation, but it was just going to be for the most part um, a very, very limited animation and then an effect animation of having like uh, what you kind of talked, what we talked about before the show, maybe, um, was just like a, an effect warping through, or I guess it was the beginning of the show, but just like a, like a sparkle thing or like what we've seen on like a mystique from X-Men of like, just like this like wave that kind of travels up the body as it changes. Um, but I wanted to have like a figure getting stabbed in the stomach by another, like by, uh, an unchanged doppelganger. And just like do like one, two, three frame of just like knife goes in, but then have like the warp up the body of them changing into the other person. But I, uh, one, animation take a while, so I decided not to do so this morning. But like two, um, like when I read that same thing of like, oh, it doesn't change clothes, I'm like, hmm, it'll be just a person standing naked looking at it, <laughs> like afterwards. I'm like, I like it. But I was, like, trying to pick out angles. I'm like, how much butt can we see? How do I turn this? What's a good stabbing pose that we're still hiding a lot of stuff? Uh, hmm, hmm. I don't know. So right here, you can kind of see the issue where, with the proximity of where the hands are to where the torso is, the, the, the changing yeah, the mesh... Leg. <laughs> the changing mesh doesn't know where to go. Um... And, yeah, I probably should have fused the pants with the torso, but I didn't because it's a clothing, and for some reason I thought that I couldn't have the mesh go into that one. Oh well, things to learn for the next time. The other thing that was really hard, too, with this one is that the, the method that I chose means that I have to fit the doppelganger into the clothing that it's going to occupy as the changed fake link. And that was something that I didn't realize was going to be a problem until I was maybe about 15 minutes into like sizing the, what my, my doppelganger representation, um, into the same like height and like position as the link model. <laughs> So I was like, oh crap, I wonder if I'm going to have to like make this doppelganger like even skinnier, if I'm going to have to change some stuff. Hmm. I wonder how weird it's got to be like shifting like that, of having like, I'm looking right now at like the length of their arms. <laughs> and like that is, that's a weird one. Like I've been recently, I do this every once in a while because I'm a little bit weird, but... Uh, just doing things with my left hand, and so I've been brushing my teeth with my left hand, and it's strange that like uh, over the like the past couple days, I've gotten good. I can do a, a nice back and forth action, but I can't replicate the nice circular actions that I tend to do with my right hand. Mm. Like, like it takes it's taking a while <laughs> to like get it to where it used to be. Yeah, I would imagine that the doppelganger and any shapeshifter really like if they're able to morph their you know their skin then like maybe their bones aren't really made of like pure calcium like ours is you know like it's <clears> just like it's got other things in it that let it morph so it's more cartilaginous and stuff so it's a lot more like a like a cuttlefish <laughs> in that sense Which, I don't know, I mean, even still, like, bone-wise, but, like, having to deal with those subtle differences of being, like, an inch off, like, could you imagine, they're like, oh, yeah, I go and reach for my cup, and I, I reach for the fucking cup over here, like, <laughs> like, there we go, or they do the thing of, like, bringing, uh, bringing a straw to their face, and the straw is not exactly in the right spot, but they're, it's mostly because they're not used to where their mouth is in, in this height. Yeah, that would be an interesting, um hint to your players if you ever throw a doppelganger in is like if the doppelganger is spent 
like if you get some intel that there's a doppelganger that's been spending like the last two years um infiltrating and getting information on like a like on a troop of gnolls or something and you're supposed to meet them in a bar he's now looking like this you know he's either looking like a like a male dwarf or a female elf you know you got to look around there's just this one like dwarf that's just really struggling to like find like find where his mouth is now just living for two years with a muzzle and then now he's got this short like dwarf beard that he's got to deal with he just keeps spilling it in his beard and it's like oh fuck <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be good. And like, like top spies and actors, I'm sure that they're better at it. But there's still got to be like some little mistakes of like, oops, I keep on reaching with my left hand, but I should be reaching with my right. <laughs> oh, oops, I just restarted your thing. Um, so that was my thing. And then this is the finished result. Oh, no, uh, where is it? <laughs> Here, this is the finished result. <laughs> the the arm the, the hand just kind of stays there a little bit but um i was happy i was actually kind of happy with that like it's a little janky but that's because i didn't really put a lot of effort into um the vertex points as far as like um a lot of the thing the issues with the hands could probably be fixed with um either adding the pants as mesh for it to adhere to and or weight painting if I could figure out how to get in there and um, edit the, you know, and control <laughs> those points. But what I was scared about was that one mesh was going to like shrink, like crumple first before the other one like reaches its full height. But that didn't really happen. Like it looked like, to my eyes, it looks like it's the same, you know, it's the same model, but just like one, you know, the features just kind of like melt away into this other one that's kind of blooming out, you know, blooming outward. Um, it's not as mm. cuttlefishy as I'd like it to be, but um, I think it's it's all right. There's a lot of things that could be done better, but I hate watching that foot like creep up the side of its body, yeah, <laughs> into the hand. The thing is, is that 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 base yeah that base model doesn't have an armature like I could have also added an armature to that but I wanted to get to the complicated part first before I, you know um, and I didn't want to yeah. busy myself with tedious things um, but that's how but the you know the feet are in rest position so whereas Link's feet are in pose position so um, there's obviously going to be some stick out there. You know, as far as like one's just like, eh. but I think I think it did its job. Yeah, creepy. The, yeah, the clothes, the clothes, the clothes kind of worked. I mean, I could, you know, I could do some work to expand that stuff. But the overall model, like the the volume of the model, doesn't look like it really changes too much, which is a positive in my perspective. Um, I meant to have the hair come out later because in a lot of depictions of shape-shifting in film that I've seen, um, that's what I'm used to seeing, is that usually the hair comes last, and that always was a kind of a cool aesthetic to me. Um, then just to have everything kind of just come out at once, and just like, okay, done, you know? It's like you kind of mm -hmm. slow a couple of those functions down, and then it just kind of emphasizes a little bit more. Um, yeah, so... That's my it is kind of nice at Doppelganger. Like that. I think, like, I don't know. The most change seems to happen in the arms and, like, if you're watching the legs. But <laughs> uh, I think that the subtle shifts of movement that happen in the head are actually really nice. Yeah, the head is probably my most satisfying <laughs> bit of that. Everything else is kind of like, all right, an attempt was made. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> If you were to do this again, would you try to do something different? I would, I would, I would do, I would experiment with two different ways just because my curiosity wants to find out if those other two things would work. So experiment one would be to also include the pants into the same mesh area as the torso and the arms and see if those legs would find you know if the data points would find the the tor the trouser pants before they find the mm -hmm. hands 
because that's where you see the feet going is to the hands <laughs> and yeah. it's just kind of like dang it um and then the other the other experiment would be to see if i could find some way to add a weight paint to that to tell the legs that i don't want you to go up to the hips i just kind of want you to crumple up into little nubules underneath the pants <laughs> um because again the easiest thing that i could have done was to just make two volumes and have one kind of hide and the other one reveal <gasps> reveal the the other one but whatever this one was a lot more <laughs> this one was a lot more practice for me to do and to, just to see like what the minimal amount of effort would look like and there it is right there minimal minimal amount of effort <laughs> all right so that was the doppelganger it was a little frustrating but it what there an attempt was made where is my D, D beyond what comes next um we will be taking mm. a break as far as next sunday goes so mm -hmm. um i'll probably be beyond doing some other weird thing all right um so what is our opinion on so the next one alphabetically is the draco lich but there's also drag shadow dragon and then just dragons in general do we want to just jump straight into dragons or uh i i don't know we had talked about doing a like maybe like what we had done before with the demons and devils of doing like a like a a young and old, or doing a chromatic, then a metallic. And so we could do something like a chromatic, a metallic, and then an other. And or we could start with the other, and then a chromatic and metallic, or something like that. And so one of us does like a Dark Lich, and the other one does like a Shadow Dragon, or many of the, I don't know, the Elemental Dragons, or Chaos Dragons, or whatever those are. Gem Dragons. Let's start with the standard dragon so chromatic and metallic and we can talk more on if we want to do a young and an old but um i definitely want to do at least one of the one of the goods and one of the bads and then um in that in that discussion of do we want to do a young one and an adult one we can also talk about if we want to do an other so the draco lich or the shadow dragon as far as what the book is telling me right now and then there's also like you said the elementals and the crystalline if you yeah. remember that those or we could go to like fairy dragon or the dragon turtle into that mix the dragon turtle is after dragons <laughs> actually and i don't know i think that's right. i think that's pretty dragon adjacent that it doesn't have to be lumped in with the dragons plus it's a pretty different shape that i would like to kind of maybe do that one by itself okay so um yeah so uh when next we meet dragons um and we'll either present one chromatic and then the next week we'll do one metallic or vice versa or we'll do a young whatever we'll figure it out and so thank you for tuning in this week um again we will take a break for next week so um be sure to tune in the following week <laughs> sunday 2 p.m uh if you are watching on youtube be sure to catch us live on twitch.tv slash foxstar f-o-x-s-t-a-r-r if you want to see more of Even's work, you can um, drop in on Instagram at EvenStarLong. And um, that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs> um...